All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Chris Keshin. I'm one of the co-directors of the Expo, along with Gabe. Um, and this panel is a VC investor panel. So before we dive into questions, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, maybe starting with Dan and working this way. Hey, all right, cool, this works. Um, my name is Dan Matuszewski. Um, most recently, co-founder of CMS, which is a principal trading and investing shop. Um, we do a fair bit of venture-based investing, which will be primary focus of this. And uh, before that, I was at Circle for like four years and change. Um, so through a lot of the buildup of like what we like sort of know crypto as today. And then briefly before that, worked for Kraken. So i um, been doing this for a fair amount of time. Hi, uh, Kurt Fluger. I'm with LD Capital. I'm a venture partner there. Uh, before that, I was a tech entrepreneur out in Silicon Valley. Uh, had a couple of exits and then went down the rabbit hole of uh, crypto and started investing and advising startups in the space about five years ago. Hi, everyone. I'm Akshi. I'm a partner at Kraken Ventures. Uh, it's not a corporate VC, but I was at Kraken for two years before this. Prior to that, I was at Consensus. I launched the Consensus Academy Developer Program. And before crypto blockchain stuff, I was in traditional financial services. I was a director at BlackRock in New York, and then also was at Condé Nast, leading digital product strategy for Condé. And then before that, I actually started my career right here in Boston with the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, where I was for about eight years, part of their core financial services practice. My undergrad, though, was in comp science and engineering um, at IIT, a different institute of technology. But it's uh, nice to be back on a campus after several years. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital, and apparently my mic does not work. <laughs> yeah, I'm Joey Krug, and uh, I'm one of the partners at Pantera Capital. We're an asset manager solely focused on the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Check, check. All right, we're good. Um, hi, I'm Catherine, uh, Catherine Wu. I'm a venture partner at Archetype, which is an early stage crypto venture capital firm in New York. Before that, I uh, led the Coinbase Ventures team, making investments into crypto startups on behalf of Coinbase. Before that, I was an investor and also an operator in the crypto space. I started my career as a lawyer and found crypto uh, and quickly left that behind. So good to be here today. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. So. Um, I want to try to work through three thematic areas during this 45 minutes that we have together. Um, briefly, those are the state of the VC market, uh, investing in crypto, and then some trends that you all are uh, seeing in the space. So we'll start with the state of the market from a VC perspective. Um, I want to understand how what happens in the liquid crypto markets affects early stage investing. So for example, how does a pullback in the liquid crypto markets uh, affect the VC environment? Uh, or how does a market sell off like we've seen recently affect valuations in the space? Um, and then how do you all deal with that volatility? So any of you feel free to jump in. I could start because I'm closer, and then we can move our way down. Okay. Um, I think the answer to this question probably depends on the fund structure and also maybe the stage of the investor. So, for example, archetype is pre seed, you know, exception capital. So, because its investment time horizons are so long, um, I think volatility in the immediate liquid market probably for us is a little bit less concerning. In fact, it might be okay because generally speaking, when we go into a bear market, it kind of flushes out like the FOMO a little bit, it flushes out some of the tourist. Investors, um, and so you know, from the pre-seed and subject capital stage, um, I think that's actually you know maybe actually kind of a good thing. Um, but again, I think if you ask you know investors that are a little bit more growth or maybe even liquid fund managers, they will have a different answer. Yeah, I think if you look at um, the liquid markets, they they tend to take a while to impact private markets. Uh, in traditional VC, that's a true statement. It, in, in crypto, it's even more true. I remember last cycle, you know, the peak was like late December, you know, 2017, and you know, private market valuations didn't really drop substantially, I would say, until summer 2018. And so I haven't seen that much of a drop yet. I've seen a little bit, uh, especially on the, on the more kind of later growth stage stuff. Um, and my kind of thesis on it is that if prices even just stay where they're at or go down further on the public side, the kind of traditional VCs that are investing in crypto right now will kind of like, you know, fade out, the tourists will, will go back home, and then prices will, will drop. Um, 
I, and I think they'll drop a lot on the equity side, probably not as much on the early token side, just because there's so much dry powder that's crypto native, and the tourists aren't really playing in that sector as much. So that's, that's my view. Yeah, um, I'm happy to go next. I agree with uh, what, what both of you have said so far. I think we are kind of weathering that storm pretty well for precisely those two reasons, because of this nice blend in our portfolio of token versus equity investments, but also because we are early stage versus late stage. I will say that, you know, the crypto markets are obviously not immune to macro factors, like, you know, whether it's inflation, whether it's interest rates, whether it's a war that's going on, et cetera. Um, and obviously, the volatility in the cryptocurrencies you know, does, does, does happen because of the macro conditions. But I think there was even an, uh, a report that just came out recently, the Galaxy report. It's actually pretty good for Q1 of 2022. And what I thought was really surprising in that was that all the way up until the summer of 2021, that volatility in crypto actually did seem to impact the inflows into the VC space. But starting the summer of 2021, all the way up until Q1 2022, which is very recent, that volatility doesn't seem to have impacted inflows with respect to venture, venture investing in crypto at all. And I think a lot of that is because of this dry powder that's coming in with these mega funds that, that are being started by existing players and then all also new entrants into the space. So there's just a ton of competition um, and a ton of dry powder. And unlike other verticals and industries where public markets set the price for private markets, we just are seeing a little bit of the reverse. And there's this huge mismatch between public versus private market pricing. And that actually plays out much more at the later stages. So we are, we're a little bit shielded. So totally agree with you guys. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great time to be a startup. There's so much capital available out there, even, even with the, the pullback that has happened. I mean, I think that has affected the, uh, the kind of the spray and pray methodology of some, some investors. But I think um, at LD Capital, same, uh, Catherine, we're, we're also, you know, long-term token investors, and we're, you know, we, we see that ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're in this for the long term, so I, I don't see uh, an effect on, on our activity at this point. Yeah, I think I'm just going to echo what the previous people sort of said here. I mean, there, there should be a lag effect, right? Like money gets raised, it has to get deployed. I think if you were out there trying to raise a new round of financing for a new fund, you'd probably be seeing like a lot of softening. I mean, I'm not having those conversations, but I have to imagine that like the pool of immediate capital looking to like get into riskier sort of bets should be coming down with like public large markets getting killed. Um, but again, like a lot of that money is already raised, right? So there should be like a lag lead relationship going on that you'll see play out. So we've seen some softening, not a ton. I don't think you will unless, look, if like liquid markets stay down here for six months, like yeah, eventually that's gonna like bleed through and like you'll start to see like valuations come down just because the pool of immediate capital sort of will come down. And a lot of like the recycled sort of like profits will like slow down as like things don't open up like sort of like at certain multiples and like people like hold on to positions longer. So I think that will cut back on the immediate capital. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and Dan, you mentioned uh, new funds raising capital. So um, my next question is, last year, I think 33 billion was invested by uh, venture capital funds in the crypto space, which is more than the last 10 years combined. And a lot of new funds are raising capital. Um, can you talk about how the space has evolved since you all have been investing? Um, and feel free to take that in, in whichever direction you want, competition versus cooperation or the mechanism by which you invest in projects? Yeah, I'll take that one to start. So um, I think, like, Joey's been doing this as long as me, too. So yeah, <laughs> he's definitely seen the cycles, too. Um, I think, like, the, the biggest thing, like, obviously, the numbers are so much bigger, right? Like, I mean, like, there was a point where, like, all of crypto was, like, basically just Bitcoin. And, like, that was a billion dollars. So it's, like, how many billion-dollar companies can you staple on top of that? Like, not many. So it was, like, it was very, it was just, like, a small market. Like, there was only so much you could possibly gain from it. So there was, like, very little interest in sort of investing in it. And if you were going to do anything at all, this was, like, the big argument for the longest time is, well, why don't I just, like, own Bitcoin? And, like, it was a pretty good argument, right? Like, it actually ended up working out sort of as, like, look, if you think the whole market's got to grow for this company to grow, you should just, like, sort of own the underlying and do that. But it, it, it was hard to just own Bitcoin structurally for, like, a lot of venture investors. And then, like, a lot of liquid guys just didn't want to do it because the ball is on the planet, like, no other, right? So, like, that was, like, the thing that pushed them back. Anyway, what you see now is, like, there, you, you saw, like, the rise of Ethereum was, like, a big turning point, right? Like, that mattered because there was, like, a second crypto asset that, like, 
retained and accrued and had a value proposition. And that started to then grow in, you see this whole 2017 wave of things stapled on top of ETH, but even more specifically is like, people were building alternative L1s, which sort of came to fruition this round, and there was a lot of wealth creation there. And there's a lot of people who are looking to sort of like continue this trend of like, there will be more crypto assets, and some of them are gonna like accrue a ton of value. And we're willing to take a lot of bets to sort of like get this upside as like this market grows like horizontally. So like that, that I think has been the biggest trend I've seen is that it's, it's shifted less from like, this is gonna be all Bitcoin, that's the future, to sort of a bunch of different L1s and other different protocols that sit on top of them that will like retain value. And that's just caused the numbers to explode because there's so many avenues of like value creation that can happen on top of that. So I, I think that's the biggest thing and that's probably why the numbers have gotten just so much bigger besides the fact that inflows just in general have been high to the industry. There's just more money moving around. Yeah, I think also um, it, there have, because there is so much capital, there, there have been a proliferation of uh, duplicate kind of uh, startups that you see. Um, sometimes my, my eyes go into a dark stare when I, I see another um, presentation that looks like the 12 that I've seen before that, that all look kind of the same. But I think that there, there are definitely some interesting things happening on the builder side where uh, you see more kind of incubation of ideas or teams that have had success in the past that are trying to solve a problem. And those are kind of unique opportunities at the early stage that we're starting to focus in on. Yeah, I, I agree with, with what was said. I also agree with what Dan said about the kind of evolution of the space over time. I think one thing that's also evolved over time is if you look at you know, the VCs in the space, like I remember at Pantera when I first joined, you know, we were not leading most of the rounds we did. Uh, we were you know, participating. And then you know, these days we're leading like 75% of the rounds we do and so much so that now of our total number of deals we've done, half of them are rounds that, rounds that we've led or, or co-led. So a lot of these crypto firms are now kind of you know, leading financing rounds due to the increased amount of capital in the space, um, which makes it you know, more competitive, I would say, um, especially like you, know, you, have, you also have some founders that you know, over the years have kind of had this idea of like doing like a party round where you have like you know, 10 to 20 VCs. That was really popular at certain points in 2017. It was really popular in certain points in 2020 and 2021 as well. Um, and then what happens is, it, this usually happens when a new influx wave of entrepreneurs come in, and then people realize that actually that's a terrible idea, because um, you just get a little bit of help from 20 people, and you don't get a lot of help from somebody who actually cares, because there is no one who actually cares, because they don't have enough invested in your company. And then like the whole cycle resets, and the thing repeats, you know, probably over and over indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um on, on that question, the, the part of your question around competition, I think I will say that the competition, you know, it's, it's encouraging to hear that even that you guys are seeing competition increasing as well, because we as a smaller fund definitely feel that the competition is very high. It's, it's an entrepreneur's market right now, absolutely, and I think that's going to continue. I think it's even going to get even more competitive going forward if, if you look at the venture industry itself evolving. Uh, with regards to sort of decentralized fundraising or what does venture capital mean with respect to just, you know, companies maybe even starting to raise through our DAO structure and never actually, you know, becoming available to traditional VCs for investing um, in terms of the structure that they're using to raise funding to begin with. So I think the competition is just going to keep increasing. Um, I also think that it's very interesting to see traditional institutional investors like, I think there was Fidelity in the audience and, you know, a couple of the other um, sort of more traditional financial services companies um, that are that that used to at least five years ago when I was in this space talk about never ever investing in a token deal or a token structure and now not only are they investing in you know through venture capital arms or you know into other venture funds but they're also doing direct investments that are token structures obviously for us it was a no-brainer in the sense that it wasn't even a question to think about you know token versus equity deals you kind of have to do token deals if you need to participate in a lot of the the innovative use cases out there that are only token deals etc but I think especially in addition to venture funds that are native to the crypto space, if large financial services institutions and traditional institutions are also getting uh, more comfortable with token structures, the competition is just going to increase. 
Um, yeah, to bring it back to what Dan said earlier about the evolution of the space, um, being an investor in the space is actually just really fun because you've seen, you know, I think five years ago, you're invested in, you know, very like layer ones or really technical solutions. Now that the infrastructure is more mature, we're seeing applications, we're seeing things that are just like more mainstream. So NFTs really, I think, cross the chasm. You know, I live in Williamsburg in Brooklyn and you walk outside, there are like posters of NFTs. There's an NFT wall. Um, there are posters of OpenSea around. And, you know, there are also really fun companies like Endstate, you know, the sneakers actually that Dan is wearing, uh, bridging NFTs to physical assets. You know, it's just, it's more consumer. And so even as, as an investor, you're con constantly thinking, you know, kind of new ways to think about how to help your portfolio companies. So for example, you know, a few years ago, you know, if it's super technical, maybe you're, you know, it's more, you bring a technical talent. And then these days, especially with, like I said, you know, NFTs and more consumer things, you're thinking about distribution, go to market, um, so I think as an investor, you're constantly learning. The industry's gotten way bigger. Um, so that's all been, I think, really awesome to see. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So I've, I've got a lot of follow-on questions, but we'll save that for after the panel in the interest of time. Uh, we'll keep moving. So uh, let's move on to valuing deals. I think a, a lot of people in this room are curious with the, the valuations in this space, how you all think about uh, valuing crypto deals and, and heuristics that you all use? I'm happy to start. Um, so, so I think there's kind of this interesting question that everyone always asks, like, how do you value deals? And like when we hire people, they always ask me this question as well. And, and the interesting thing about on the private market side is you can't really do that much, right? Like there's like plus or minus 20% you know, bounds that you can pay for a deal and like you'll still get the deal. Like you can underpay by 20% in some cases if the, part, if the founder really wants to work with you. But you can't like, you know, say I want 50% of what you're asking. It just, it just won't work. Um, and so the question usually is like, either what price do I want to like slightly get this a bit lower to? Or do I just want to pay the asking price? Or do I want to actually offer them 50% more? Or some other number, you know, that's, that's more. And so it's more of a kind of a binary question, like given this team, given their backgrounds, given what they're working on, given how aggressive they are, um, are they gonna actually be able to execute on this thing, get it into market, ship it, you know, make something massive? And like, I think, like the best example of this I can think of is when we looked at um, Alchemy when we led the Series A, it was pretty, I mean, not, not these days, but back then it was a pretty high valuation. It was like a 70 million post money uh, equity valuation. And, you know, they had like two customers and two of them were companies that I'm affiliated with. One was Augur and the other one was Pantera. Um, but we saw the product and it was so good and the founders were so aggressive um, and like so like relentless um, that we decided to back it. And you know, it, was, it was probably like you know, 50 to 70% more than what it was quote unquote worth. Um, but now it's worth you know, or, orders of magnitude more than that. And so I think like, it almost becomes a binary question on the, on the private side versus maybe on the public side, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more granular. But on the private side, it's really a binary, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think um, because we focus on the early stage, I think the problem is not that different uh, from other industries in the sense that, you know, when you think about multiples and valuations and cash flow and all these projections and forecasts, at that early of a stage, a lot of that is just kind of winging it anyway in any industry. Um, so for us, a lot of it becomes, as, as you said, about um, looking at the team, looking at their uh, ability to go to market, looking at their past track record of prior sort of successful exits or successful companies that they've had before. Um, and I think that um, for us, it also, because we are a relatively smaller fund and we plan to always be a relatively small fund so that we can be very hands-on with our portfolio companies, some of it also boils down to is the valuation so high and are the check sizes that we are going to write, um, the max check sizes that we're going to write, going to be such a small portion of that round that we are not going to be able to allocate the kind of mind share and strategic hands-on partnership that we want to provide to each of our portfolio companies. So I think at that point, it really just becomes about what's our share of that round that'll that'll give this portfolio company enough mind share on the team to support them. Um, those are the kinds of things we really look for. But um, you know, I don't think that our space can benefit from the hedge fund kind of modeling. You can kind of model those numbers all day long. And also, if you think about cash flows, a lot of the projects out there, the cash flows don't actually go back to the investors. Otherwise, it would be a security. And so you can look at cash flows as from like a, from a business sense perspective, but in terms of modeling it out mathematically as, as it's done in a lot of other industries, I don't think that really applies in our space. 
Yeah, I, w I agree with everything that was said previously. And I think the other thing that um, we see is that, you know, in a buoyant market, obviously valuations are much higher than, than what you have in a, in a bear market. And it's just something we deal with. And, and echoing uh, the comments earlier, I mean, we really bet on, on the jockey, not the horse. So if we think the team is, is capable and, uh, and can make it, make it happen, then, then typically it's a, it's a go for, for what the valuation is set. Yeah, I think what ends up happening in crypto a lot is it's, it's really hard to know what the like, market opportunity is. Um, like, sometimes it's just downright impossible, right? Like, a lot of this stuff, you can, like, you could keynote and be like, listen, like, this kind of looks like this, and like, we saw how that played out, and that market, as it stands right now, is sort of this size, and it's like liquid, and it's available, and it's usable. And like, the, the certain, sometimes you get this thing where you're like, I'm trying to build X on Y, and it's like already exists on like ETH, and I'm trying to do it. Like that, that you can do a little bit more, but what ends up happening is, there's so much hot money sort of like pushing in on the early side a lot of times, it just starts pushing things up, right? And then you just end up like, being like, well, this raised at X, and like, this is probably why like market opportunity, even though it's just a complete guess with like sort of the size of that is. So it starts like ratcheting everything up like sort of as it goes. And I think you've seen this very much over like the last year and a half in particular as like the things that were liquid like very much like ran up and like that was what you were sort of using as like a yardstick. Um, so that in crypto, again, I said this, this is very hard because you can't just sit down on paper and be like, I know that there's this many potential customers that are like paying X or like, this is what the market opportunity is because this stuff is, is wildly unknown, like even what the final iteration is gonna be often, like let alone like how many potential users there are. Because like, like how much has the crypto market sort of like net daily average users changed in like the last like year, right? It's like massive. So you're trying to like guess these sort of like changes on top of like what a product would like have as a niche in that. It's just, you're, you're doing a lot of like baselining back to things that you already know. And like when the liquid markets run up, it just drags everything with it. It's not a bad thing. It's good as like somebody who's trying to build something because I think you get venture investors like imaginations run a little wilder than they do in other markets. So it's like you end up probably financing a lot more things that you wouldn't have if they were like more concrete sort of numbers that you're like, all right, this is like what the TAM really is. So I don't know. That's like sort of how we see it and how we try to do it. Again, it's, it's really hard. And like sometimes things you have no idea become like wildly popular and successful. So yeah, I, I think um, the other thing is, you know, premium founders or like really good founders generally will fetch a premium price, whether it's a bull or a bear market. Like I'm thinking back to the last bear cycle, um, we had, you know, pretty rich seed rounds too with like base layers. So I do think it probably is founder dependent. Um, again, like from my seat as a pre-seed investor, it is very, very um, largely founder dependent, you know, where whether or not you come from a crypto native background, um, whether or not you, you know, it's a post or pre-market, pre, -market, pre uh, yeah, product market fit. Um, the other thing with actually investing in crypto as an investor that you want to think really carefully about, especially with um, networks or, you know, is, is kind of, you know, your ownership, right? So like I had come previously from a generalist fund, so more of a Web2 fund. So when you're investing that early, generally from like a lead investor from a Web2 fund, you kind of are thinking about like, okay, I want like 10% ownership. But I think if you're as an investor in crypto, as you're thinking about whatever value, but also think about your own ownership, generally speaking, when it's a network, you want to think about, you know, it doesn't make sense to even get 10%, generally probably no. Like when you think about when Ethereum first launched, it was kind of like no more than 5%, right? So that's a good number to also think about as an investor when you're valuing, thinking about your ownership. Um, also, you're kind of, especially with tokens, when you see liquidity earlier, it probably are all factors that you consider when you're actually pricing around. So with um, the uncertainty in investing in an early stage asset class and the liquidity that you all have with a lot of these projects through tokens, um, how do you think about exiting positions? Because you can exit much faster than in traditional VC. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, like, we, I, I think similar to Catherine and a few other folks that have spoken here, I think for us, we really are investing with a long-term horizon in mind. Um, so we do look at buyback schedules, we look at sort of the vesting schedules, et cetera. It's actually a, a little bit of a red flag for us, honestly, if the vesting schedule is too short because we are essentially looking to, to hold positions. We're not a hedge fund. And so unless the roadmap, I think the only time that we would really look to exit is you know, if the prices are so crazy that it's a fiduciary duty to our investors that we need to sort of sell, or, or if the roadmap stops being exciting anymore, or if the milestones are not being hit. Um, I, I think outside of that, we really want to take a long position on the portfolio. One of the, one of the unique problems with crypto is um, 
and I, and I, I found this like sort of over the years, um, not, not always, but w what you have is a lot of times the founders get very rich very early, um, and there's like a lot of wealth generated on the team, and I think you have a pretty good idea whether or not they're gonna stick it out and continue to like take this thing versus like coast or indoor. Like, look, I'm not saying they're like quitting, but like, look, like sometimes you just have immediate success that's just wild and like this may not be the thing that you wanna do or you don't wanna like iterate on it or you're just gonna like let it sort of like sit as it is. And that's usually a pretty good tell of like how aligned you wanna be with it like going forward. Um, it, it's not a bad thing, it's just I think very unique to crypto because the liquidity horizons are just like so much shorter than you have in like public markets, right? Like you may be like having like a rocket ship startup that's like on paper you're worth a ton of money, you know, three or four years into it. But in crypto, like that can be six months to a year and it's like, it's effectively liquid. Like you can like actually convert that over. So I think we, we cue on a lot of like what the team's like plans are, like when that success happens. And like obviously look, like there's times where like the valuation is just out of control and like doesn't make sense to the benchmarks and like that. And like benchmarks being like, what is this like equivalent to somebody else who are like raising and building this thing? And like what network effect does it have anyway, like versus that? So um, yeah, like, it, it's very, very challenging in crypto on that um, portion, just because like that liquidity horizon is so short as compared to like other markets. Yeah, and I think um, typically if, if we are exiting a position, we never would have, uh, we would have no more than 5% in, in any position uh, regardless, but we will always work with the, the teams because we, we want to make sure that um, whether we're doing a partial exit of, of those tokens, we want to make sure that we're not negatively impacting the company. And so we, we typically coordinate along with the teams before we, we actually exit. Awesome. Okay, so um, let's move on to my final category, trends. So what trends are you all watching? What are you excited about? What categories, sectors? And contrary question, what do you think is overhyped right now? So both of those questions. I can start. Um, let me start with maybe overhype, not that I think it won't work, but just a little too much heat around. Um, so a category that I really actually personally want to see work is gaming, like crypto gaming. Um, but it is also an area in which I think uh, is a little bit overhyped. And, and a lot of that is because, you know, crypto gaming right now is mostly play to earn models. Um, uh, I think time has shown us that Sometimes the in-game economies are not super sustainable. Like there's more supply than there is demand. And I think that whole thing is just a little bit off right now. Now it doesn't mean it's not gonna work. I personally would love to see something innovative. So I think just, you know, fingers crossed on that. Um, something that I think is important that I'm looking at, you know, even though I said, you know, it's across the chasm, it's mainstream, I think as applications get built out, sometimes it, un it kind of actually emphasizes how janky the infrastructure is. So I think the more boring infrastructure stuff is still really, really valuable. And like, you know, we can go as boring as like, you know, a, a crypto bank, for example. Like every startup I know has three to four different accounts, bank accounts, because they're constantly worried about getting debanked. So there's not really a good solution there for, you know, banking for crypto companies. Um, so that's like an example of a boring one, you know, even, uh, everything in crypto is, you know, you can verify it yourself. Go look it at the block, like at the blockchain. Go on EtherScan. That's still not very human readable. So I think there's still a lot of work we can do around the kind of boring, more infrastructure stuff as applications get built out. Yeah, I think um, I'll answer based on like say, stage and like asset class. So I think like if you look at the market right now, I think growth stage is still way overvalued, especially in crypto. If you look at uh, earlier growth stage, like Series Bs, it, it's kind of like still way overvalued. We see tons of companies that have realized that we're going into like a bad period of bad times and so they're trying to raise a ton of money, but their attraction is like Series A level traction, but they want a Series B because they raised a Series A back in 2021 when you know most investors kind of lost their minds. And so and so I think like that's that's that stage. And then if you look at early stage, I think early stage is still is still a great value, great place to be investing seeds and then series A is where like the founders are really good and really strong teams just because like they're not affected as much by the macro cycle you know like when those things are worth a lot of money who knows what interest rates are going to be like it's it's just like so far off especially on the equity side um, and then I, I I also like you know like the, on the public side like I, I don't know if we've quite bottomed yet but I think like it's it's definitely much more attractive than it was you know in, in like March April last year um, and so at some point, I think that'll be a, another interesting kind of area to sort of play capital into. Yeah, um, 
<clears throat> I'm happy to talk about what I'm excited about in the space. I know this is not new anymore, but I, this is what I spoke about at ETH Denver as well, was um, I'm personally psyched about stable coins. Um, I, you know, we just had the Terra talk, so I think applications that are stable coin based, I think it's gonna be huge. I think the second, second place that I'm personally really interested in is uh, kind of related to the infrastructure side, so uh, the CFI to DeFi bridge and sort of integrating that, I think it's going to be immaterial, hopefully, in the future, um, you know, whether the user is a crypto native user or not. And I think any, especially for us as Kraken Ventures, where we are focusing on this integration between fintech and crypto slash blockchain, we invest in fintech companies as well. Um, I really think that that user experience, as well as the use cases, it should all be seamless access to DeFi for non-crypto users as well. So that anything that's being built there is exciting to me personally, even though it's kind of back endy and not as sexy. Um, and then the third thing that's going to be interesting, I think, is NFTs are probably going to go much further than art and music. Um, and I can see a lot of applications that are beyond that initial sort of scratching the surface there. The last one, I'll just say it because it's contextual right now, is if anyone can come up with a true decentralized amazing social media platform, despite all of the news right now, that would actually be amazing to watch. Um, I think in terms of things that are overhyped, for me personally, um, maybe it's overhyped or maybe I just don't get it yet and I'm still educating myself, is metaverse. And <laughs> the second piece that I'm still sort of wrapping my head around is the number of L1s that are springing up. And that's probably because I started off with Ethereum and I'm you know, still an Ethereum lover at heart, but those are the two places. Great, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Catherine. I, I have always uh, believed that, that, not that GameFi can't work, but I think it's, it's um, maybe there are still some things that need to be worked out uh, for that to be a, a kind of a, a mass adoption um, sector. And I think that's starting to happen. You're starting to see some more uh, kind of AAA gaming studio talent kind of moving into the space, and, and things are starting to starting to happen in the economic models and the play to earn and so forth. They're kind of evolving, so I think that's that's a good thing. I'm also uh, excited about the kind of the C5 to D5 bridge and what you know what uh, what is what are required the requirements to actually make that that work for for everyone. Um, I'm also excited about some of the infrastructure plays that are happening because as this industry grows, there, there is a need for, uh, for, for the tools that allow for any of, these, um, any of these platforms to continue to operate. So that's what I'm excited about. So uh, what am I most excited about? I, I would say that I, I've been probably wrong on this thus far, but I, I have an assumption or at least a thesis that like there'll be, there'll be on-chain DeFi derivative platforms that like sort of rival what you see on the centralized side. Um, you saw this a little bit with Spot, right? Like Uniswap like holds a real like number against like what you see on like sort of the Spot side with some of the larger venues. And, and I do think there's a world that that'll like move on the deriv side. Um, options probably later, like swaps and like tendered, uh, tendered futures to like start. I still like think that that's like a thesis that's like pretty much like being valued at zero now. Um, so, and I think there's some like upside on that like as like a sort of trend. But I had to say like what I, what I think is like overvalued um, I think like probably the biggest like section of stuff that I see like is overvalued is um there's like a, there's, there's so definitely like in line with like the alt like L1 thesis of like there just being too many and too much like that that's probably right in aggregate but there's also this like, this whole growing like layer zero trend that's like sort of like grown in the last six months and there's many many millions of dollars being poured into like many different projects all at one for something that I'm not entirely sure. Even like the base case utility is going to be like that huge, let alone because um, I think it has to fight with the exchanges for sort of part of that business. So I think that that's been a little frothy sort of coming out of the gate. But yeah, those are my. So follow on question uh, to that. The, there are a lot of students in the room, a lot of budding entrepreneurs. Are there areas that you maybe wish you saw more startups building in? Actually, you, meant to, you mentioned uh, decentralized social media. We don't have to go one by one, but just if anybody has anything off the top of their head. Somebody needs to make a good accounting system. 
And I, I, I swear to God, you will be the richest person in this state if you can like do it. Um, it's, it's, it's an insurmountable problem. Like it's very hard to like, so just for like perspective, right? CMS is 16 people. We keep three in-house accountants just to like keep track of things, which is like a colossal waste of resources. And I don't say this like despairingly to any of those people that we employ. They're great. They're awesome at their job. It's just, this it should be a software solvable problem. It just like isn't. And I don't know anybody operating in this space doing any volume at scale that doesn't have a massive headache there that like cannot get it fixed. And I hope if you guys have portfolio companies that are trying to do this, like I hope they do do it, but like it right now is just like not, it is not anywhere close to where it needs to be. It, it's it's a, not sexy, but it's gonna make a ton of money for somebody. It's also ironic because blockchain essentially is at the end of the day a ledger. So you would think like when I started off in the blockchain space like several years ago, accounting it would be a no brainer, right? But you're right, I haven't seen a good implementation there. I'd like to see a, um, a borrow aggregator. So there's a lot of stuff where you lend capital out and they'll find you the highest yield, but I'd like to see the flip side. There's a couple of startups working on that, but nobody's really uh, cracked it and, and got traction, but I still think it'd be interesting. Um, and then also, if, if anyone's doing any gaming startups, um, I'll take the flip side of this, of this thesis, and so feel free to shoot me an email if you're working on that, because um, we're bullish on that space. Okay, awesome. Well, final question. So this is and has been historically a, a Bitcoin-focused conference. Um, so with all of this innovation that you are seeing uh, at the bleeding edge, what role do you think Bitcoin will play in this crypto ecosystem in the future? Um, well, first and foremost, I don't think we would really be here without Bitcoin. So I think we should at least acknowledge that first. Um, secondly, I think it, Bitcoin will remain a massive onboard for institutions, which I think is good for the space in general. Um, we also saw you know, this year, or maybe this year and a half, two uh, countries recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. So again, I think you know, the idea, the notion of being able to opt out of uh, your given tr uh, financial system, I think is really powerful. Um, and so, yeah, and I think, yeah, it's just uh, understanding that, recognizing that, and uh, yeah. I think it's still, it's still the largest net inflow of sort of like dollars and like people into the ecosystem. Um, I mean, look, there's people that make a lot of arguments that like ETH will like flip it and whatnot, but like as it stands, I still think like that's, that's your yardstick you have for like aggregate sort of health of like the industry as a whole. So I think that's still pretty important. And that's like what we use it on as like a metric, but um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's, there's not a lot of like venture opportunity around Bitcoin. There's not too many people looking to raise to do things on top of it. Yeah, I mean, and we see that it is obviously um, everything, everything that we're doing is, is tightly correlated to the value in Bitcoin. So uh, as, as the Bitcoin market grows, then so too does, uh, does our market. I would say that obviously, you know, we wouldn't be here without Bitcoin, but I do think that the role of Bitcoin is not the same as it was eight years ago. And I do think that the industry has come much further since then, uh, especially in the venture space. But I, th I still think that Bitcoin has a role to play in areas like, I don't know, lightning payments, as you mentioned, in a lot of economies that have a lot of volatility. Um, and it, it is still the bread and butter for, for some, of the, some of the applications there. So there could be something exciting there. But yeah, I do think from a venture perspective, we've moved much further than that. I, I think the um, really kind of like stupid simple answer is like the classic like digital gold one. Um, I, I really do think like you think about, you know, commerce and, and like how transactions will take place. Like the majority of marketplaces in my opinion, you know, by like 2050 or so will probably be digital. Um, and so if you envision kind of like what does gold look like the, in this kind of like new like economy, like it, it's Bitcoin, um, which is not like a super interesting answer. Like it's a little boring, but um, I, do, I do actually buy into kind of the digital gold thesis. Okay, so we have uh, about four minutes left. I'm gonna open it up to two, potentially three questions from the audience, um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, hello, um, my name is Andri, and I represent uh, a startup, NFT startup. And uh, right now we are working on a project NFT patents, so we're gonna register uh, copyright, we're gonna register ideas as an NFTs in the blockchain. And uh, we already like developing the part like on the, the website, the minting and stuff like that, but we have a problem. Uh, we don't know 
who to choose to work with uh, to raise uh, funds for a project. We don't know, like we have some choices with the different networks, uh, like one network, like Polygon, they offering like 10,000 or more dollars to work with them. BNB offering something else. And like, what's your suggestion? What to start with, with the raising of money? Also, we have an idea like to raise money uh, by uh, selling our first NFT collection with uh, uh, different, uh, like with the discounts, with the with access to the VIP club uh, for our project. Maybe it's the, the best way, or like, what's your suggestions? <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, actually, that's something we didn't talk about, but these, um, all of these uh, layer one uh, and, and EVM uh, chains have, have foundations where they have free money. So you've got grants that are available, and it's really, I think it's up to you and your, your, your team to determine and maybe it's maybe it's not just one. Maybe you you got you you can actually get grants from multiple uh, multiple layer ones. So that's um, that's another avenue for for startups. There's free money out there. Yeah, I definitely take the money and definitely look. Just be honest, right? Be like, look, we're gonna like pursue a multi-chain future. I mean, you could raise from like or raise isn't the right word, but like you could sort of take grants for like three or four people. I I wouldn't. As somebody who's like communicates with the L1s and like sort of like knows like this whole thing that's going on, like I wouldn't feel that like you should feel married to it just because like you're using like it's like look, it would be bad if you like took it and did nothing with the chain, but like if you pursue it and it just like doesn't work out and you go somewhere else, like I, I don't think you should view it as like this is like a huge technological decision that you're like making for like the foreseeable future. Like, I don't know. Look at it as more of a prototype thing. It's a win for both sides. Okay, thank you. Follow us on Twitter, NFT Patent. <laughs> thank you. All right, one more question. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much for this panel. I enjoy every second second. Uh, are you accepting any applications for new? new Always. 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 Do you have your business card and where to start? <laughs> we'll talk. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. OK, we're going to wrap it up there. If you have additional questions, I think we'll, we'll convene out side of this room. Uh, so if you want to talk to any of the panelists, we'll be outside. Thanks so much.